the crown fraud. Information provided to H.E. Cardinal Momberti and the Vatican Chancery Court regarding our claims March 6, 2005, January 19, 2023 in Sikh. As we research these gigantic fraud schemes it becomes apparent that the instigation and inspiration for most of it comes to us via Britain, and to Britain via Rome, and this is true even when the fraud itself has far earlier sources. It also becomes apparent that individual fraud schemes are repeated over time, thus, history does repeat itself, especially bad history. It stands as circumstantial proof that we have a significant portion of society which is singularly devoted on an ongoing multi-generational basis, to developing and implementing fraud schemes against the rest of humanity, and they do this on a professional basis to accrue both money and coercive power. How else can you account for the sudden reappearance of a distinct 1500-year-old fraud scheme which we refer to as the Justinian deception, promoting the use of dog Latin in the modern era? Or the current reiteration of the 300-year-old Bottomry Bond scandal? The final years of the original Roman Empire provided a hotbed of such schemes, most of which issued from the government established in Constantinople as a means to coerce money and service from the faithful. Other notable flowerings of fraud come to us from Portugal in the Middle Ages and Renaissance Italy and Flanders, but no nation on earth can claim a longer or more illustrious career of promoting frauds both large and small, than Britain. This observed history may stem from Britain's cultural fondness for wordplay, puns, double meanings, jests, jokers, games of chance, linguistics, cryptology, and theatre. However it happened, the countries of the British Isles and in particular, England and its government, had a well-established reputation for perfidy and deceptive practices as far back as we can trace the grumblings of its neighbours and trading partners. Within Britain it is possible to trace the threads of this widespread activity back to one point source, the inner city of London, the heart of banking and the home of the legal profession. And also the worldwide centre for a pagan religion that cements the observed facts together and provides the multi-generational focus and organisational strength to pick and choose and run these gigantic fraud schemes on a global basis. The nature of this pagan religion at once suggests itself from the fact that it does not centre around a church, but instead, a temple, and the temple bar or bale, a linguistic double for ball. Its connections to Rome and the Roman government are apparent from the black robes and white wigs of its adherents, as these costumes have been worn by the galley, priests of Cybele, also known as Semiramis, Isis, Astarte, and, tellingly, Columbia, since at least the 2nd century BC, when these strange persons arrived in Rome and began working as tax collectors for Caesar. Taken together with the Bar Association's registration as a theatre and entertainment company in the present day and its arrival in England as the Merry Men Company, we can begin to see the bigger picture of how appearances, illusions, theatre, and legalised fraud for profit, has been employed by governments ever since. The essence of legalising anything, even murder, is to treat all transactions as voluntary and provide a remedy for the imposition of such law, at the same time that it goes into effect. There always has to be an escape or exemption clause, if for no other reason than the fact that the perpetrators need a back door for themselves. The function of the galley in England was no different than the function of the galley in Rome. To collect taxes, tariffs, fines, and fees, and to do so in the name of the king, while putting a veneer of sanctimonious law over the enforcement of non-consensual labour contracts and forced acceptances of public debt. To this day in England, such citizenship obligations accrue at birth, and obligate the sinners to support an ever-increasing multi-layered bureaucracy of government of all kinds. To this day, citizenship is connected to membership in a city, be it the city of Rome or the inner city of London, or the city of Washington, D.C. or Città Vaticano. Proponents of this system often point to the city-states of ancient Greece and Anatolia as the source of their organizational scheme, but a more sober examination of the system shows that it stems, again, from Roman application of someone else's quite different original creation. It is clear from the foregoing that the religion we are dealing with is the very ancient religion of Babylon brought forward into modern times and that this religion is associated, deeply, with the government of Rome and the Romanized city-state government network that has proliferated worldwide. The kingdom of lies and entertainments thus established serves the interests of governments by collecting taxes, tariffs, fines, and fees and developing the fraud schemes and pretenses of law used to extract the labor and property of the victims. So now we finally know what we are dealing with, how these same fraud schemes keep coming back to haunt humanity.
who promotes and organizes these fraud schemes on a multi-generational basis, what provides the organizational framework, that is, the global network of city-state governments, and also the perennial motivation on the part of both the governments. Involved in the fraudsters, coercive power to force obedience and extract both labor and material wealth from the citizens. In keeping with their belief in eternal duality, there is a second side to this foreign organizational structure provided by the banks and bankers, who are also associated with ancient Babylon and the same pagan religion and its practices. Rome's city government was the conduit that brought this evil forward into the modern world, that hired the galley, that fostered and tolerated their sophisticated fraud for profit schemes, as long as the city government and government officials got their cut of the proceeds. The government's complicity and basic conflict of interest allowed the galley, then and now, to act under color of law. Sometimes they would make up a new law on the spot and follow up by kicking, beating, and biting their victims. Government is tolerated by the people of this world for a single purpose, to protect the same people and their property assets. However, the government once installed has a basic conflict of interest in that it is paid by the people for this service and is tempted to prey upon them instead in order to increase the government's own profits and expansion of its own power. It is this basic temptation and conflict of interest that lies at the heart of every government failure and this conflict is only exacerbated when a commercial vendor of government services is allowed to usurp upon the position of the actual national government. We have seen how the municipal corporations housed in the District of Columbia came here as vendors of governmental services, each having their own contract described as a constitution. The British Territorial Municipal Corporation was established according to the Constitution of the United States of America, and the city-operated municipal corporation operating the city of Washington, D.C., was established according to the Constitution of the United States. Two vendors, two contracts, one a military service contract, and the other, primarily to provide postal service. They were here and in position to usurp against both our own American federal service provider, known as the Federal Republic, and by a process of secrecy and non-disclosure, also in position to usurp upon our actual national and international government functions. This criminal fraud and gross breach of trust by both foreign service vendors organized as municipal corporations is what we bear witness to and base our fundamental claims upon. The introduction and misuse of the modern-day galley, the bar attorneys, to collect taxes, tithes, fees, fines, mortgages, war reparations and a plethora of other alleged debts for these municipal corporations via the unauthorized use of foreign military district courts and municipal administrative courts misaddressing people who don't owe these municipal corporations a penny, from people who are in fact their preferential creditors, is the rub. These foreign corporations have the right to discipline their own employees and to make demands upon them as conditions of employment. They have the right to collect fees from their employees and impose their own administrative code and policies under this same authority, but they have no authority, right, or valid reason to misaddress members of our general public, as if they were federal employees or federal citizens, either one. We have witnessed the false registration processes and false claims and entrapments under color of law that have been used to promote the idea that all the Americans suddenly lost their minds and voluntarily chose to depart their sovereignty and adopt some species of federal citizenship, instead, and also examined how and why none of these purported contracts nor any obligation seeming to result from them is valid. Likewise, the British Territorial Municipal Corporation subcontractor has no right, reason, or valid authority to misaddress members of our general public as enemy combatants, involved in any illegal mercenary conflict these service vendors have engaged in. Our states were never engaged in the civil war or any other such conflict and we have our own guarantee of peace on the land which these municipal corporations and their personnel have been conveniently ignoring in order to pursue their racketeering and extortion schemes. Similarly, these foreign service vendors can organize themselves as corporate or incorporated entities as they please, but they cannot charge the cost of their bankruptcies off against the people of this country and our assets. These evils and fraud schemes have been illegally and unlawfully imposed by military district courts and administrative courts that have been imposed upon our country illegally, unlawfully, and immorally by mere service providers acting in breach of trust and service contract two giant run amok municipal corporations which have been defrauding and defaming and impersonating our innocent people for corporate profiteering under force and color of law. We have seen exactly what the temple bar is and know the evil pantheon of gods that are worshipped there. 
We have determined the association of Rome, and in particular the city of Rome government with these perpetual fraud artists and brigands, and through the association with the city of Rome government, we have traced the advent of these same fraud artists coming to England just in time for the Great Fire of London and the Sestuit Cavai Act, or what we call the Reichstag Fire of 1666. The source of all this perennial evil, conflict, fraud, violence, unjust enrichment, unlawful conversion, and pernicious, repetitious fraud, has been run to ground at last. Also, the organizational basis for the promotion of these evils to subsequent generations has been identified, an evil pagan religion devoted to the father of all lies, Romanized city-state governments profiting themselves from all this criminal activity and fraud, and municipal corporations operating in breach of trust and service contract as vendors of government services, has been laid bare before the ecclesiastical law and the Vatican Chancery Court. Now, finally, we get to the topic of the national, Christian, and imperial crowns and the bait and switch fraud which has been used by generations of British monarchs to defraud the people of England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales and all the countries of the Commonwealth. The national crown of England is a crown of thorns, a poor, scabrous thing made of iron alloy, clothed in tattered gilt, devoid of jewels or pearls. It nonetheless sits on a velvet pillow in the royal vaults, a symbol of the good common people, subjects, as in those subjected to the lash and thorns and actual sacrifice. The Christian crown of Saint Edward similarly is in disrepair but made of gold and decorated with jewels, a bit worm-eaten and time-worn, but still viable. It hasn't been worn for any serious purpose in generations. And finally, we have the imperial crown of Rome, which the late queen wore as she sat on the chair of the estates, serving as the pope's overseer of the commonwealth, also known as territorial properties. The use of an imperial crown reappeared after a lapse of some centuries on the head of Napoleon Bonaparte. And then, mysteriously, on the head of Wilhelm II, King of Prussia. One must surmise that its appearance on the head of Elizabeth II marks the end of British hegemony. The parasite moves on. We have definitive proof presented as the High Court case of Yav v. Regina, in which the court determined that Elizabeth II pulled a bait and switch fraud on the British people, rendering her entire coronation a farce and her kissing of the Bible an act of fraud. The public face of the dutiful Christian monarch devoted to the good of humanity and the welfare of the people was a fraudulent misrepresentation and the coronation itself was an act, as in a theatre act. The contract with the British people affirmed by the coronation was overturned within three days, as if the late queen suffered buyer's remorse. She spent the rest of her life as a shill working for and under the imperial crown, walking ten paces behind the Lord Mayor of the inner city of London, obliged to worship at the crown temple and required to embrace its dreadful religion. In exchange, Elizabeth II had the wealth and splendor of the world, the same deal Satan offered Yeshua in the wilderness. Elizabeth II, like her progenitors, failed the test, took the bait, and served the wrong crown. Any contract between the late queen and the British population was thus severed and no action she took, no decree or declaration she issued, no debt she accrued and no law she approved can be charged against them. All the rules, regulations, codes, and charges against their credit that she and her administration made, stand rebutted and returned for service and for cause. This same fraud scheme, a bait, Christian monarch, and switch, pagan monarch, fraud has been routinely carried out by every British monarch since George III, rendering all their actions and contracts seeming to obligate the British people null and void for deliberate fraud, duplicity, impersonation, and misrepresentation of authority. While this great fraud only glancingly affects our government because the only service contract we have with these blighters is an explicit written sea jurisdiction contract. Establishing the law of the land for sailors, and pirates, the crown fraud affects all the people who live in the British Isles and in the former Commonwealth, and also affects all the businesses and incorporated entities that have relied on Acts of Parliament since 1763. The British Crown Corporation and its franchises stand void for fraudulent construction and unlawful activities such as the same misrepresented and undisclosed registration of live births, we have described taking place on our shores, the same theft and infringement of private copyrights on given names, the same profane practices of deceit, fraud, misrepresentation, unlawful conversion, identity theft, false trusteeships, creation of phony constructive trusts both public and private, and resulting false claims in commerce, together with the exercise of coercive powers under color of law by municipal corporations and their personnel. 
all of which have also been applied to the general public throughout the sphere of British influence worldwide. We wish for the immediate and positive action of the Vatican Chancery Court enforcing the ecclesiastical law in favor of the people and against the corporations, returning the estates, property rights, assets, and freedoms that the living people are owed, and recognizing the vacated status of the Christian crown in Britain. We wish for the liquidation or forfeiture of all British Crown corporations including but not limited to municipal corporations run by the British Crown and the return of these assets to the lawful national governments and living people to whom they naturally belong. We wish for the recognition that the land jurisdiction of Britain has been vacant because of these acts of fraud by persons misrepresenting themselves as the kings and queens of England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales and that the land grants owed to these kingdoms must naturally return to them and be vested in the common crown. We notice that it is not even clear from the bungled proceedings, which King Charles, the British Parliament swore allegiance to, so the entire British government appears to be operating in fraud. The identity and nature of the King Charles, receiving the allegiance of the members of Parliament cannot be left in doubt. Their public allegiance was given to King Charles, which might be a municipal corporation, might refer to the at that point, presumptive King Charles, might stand for King Charles I, who has been dead 300 plus years, or might be King Charles of Scotland who just happens to have the same name, but the allegiance and duty of the British Parliament can hardly, under the circumstance, be left void for vagueness. We wish for an immediate and official reply regarding who or what and in what guise and jurisdiction is the government of Britain operating. In view of the pernicious fraud that has been perpetuated against the rights and property of the British people and the bad faith displayed in the matter of the coronation and coronation oath, nothing related to the British Crown or the British monarch or the government of Westminster is being accepted. All contracts and offers are considered void for vagueness. We wish for the liquidation of the inner city of London Enclave as it has been used as a means to protect and promote criminal activities worldwide, cruelly and repetitiously injuring and defrauding generations of mankind. We wish for the liquidation of the municipality of Washington, D.C., for the reasons already given, and also because of their similar trespasses against the health, welfare, and security of the living people worldwide. It was not our intention when allowing the creation and proliferation of incorporated entities to promote a violent, criminal, and competing form of government. We wish for the offending legal persons to be washed away like so much sand returning to the beach. We wish for the dissolution of the bar associations and the overturning of all bar licenses including but not limited to letters of mark, bar cards, bar accounts, and so forth used to fund and motivate the members of this theater company. We wish for the seizure of all bar assets including land trusts, pension funds, insurance funds, and investment funds maintained for the support of these criminal actors and for the return of these assets to the victims of these masters of deceit. Attempts to outlaw and suppress the venal religion to which these organizations submit and subscribe have once again failed. Efforts by the early Roman government to eradicate this perverse religion and its teachings only resulted in spreading it throughout the Roman Empire. We wish for it and its entire history to be exposed and submitted to public scrutiny, for what it promotes, how it operates, its tenets and beliefs and practices. No longer a mystery but a known evil hidden in plain sight. The only way to get rid of nightmares and false beliefs is to submit them to reason and examination of their factual results. The religion of mystery Babylon is ripe for such an examination by the general public of the world, whereupon we are confident that it will disappear like the mirages it creates, its strong delusions left behind. We have seen it all before, and have no need to repeat any history associated with the Mystery Babylon collection of perversions, disgusting practices, superstitions, lies, and venal beliefs. Issued by, Anna Maria Riesinger, Fiduciary. The United States of America in care of, Box 520,994 Big Lake, Alaska 99,652. April 25, 2023.